Greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I have a few announcements before we get started. I'll try to make this short and sweet. That way we can go ahead and jump right into the stories. Everyone has been asking about timestamps on the videos. Those will be coming next week. I finally did my research and figured out how to do it, so I'm so sorry. It just took me a few minutes. This video will be the last video to be released for everyone to see before we go back to a regular upload schedule. The new schedule will be Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. So with that, because it's the last video for everyone to see all at once, it's everyone's favorite, the long form versions. Also, I will be starting my new clear aligner system by Bite. They're clear aligners that go over your teeth to help straighten them. So my stories next week, if I sound a little funny or with a lisp, that's what it is. I will do my best to work on that. That way it doesn't drive people crazy, but I have waited my whole life to get straight teeth and the time is now. Also, all stories from now on will start with short stories and go into the longer versions. That way, you can get accustomed to the first story and let the ambiance set in, and then you can slowly drift off into Slumberland with the longer versions of the stories. If you are enjoying what you are hearing, you can buy me a coffee as it helps support me and the channel and is very much appreciated. You will find that in the description box or pinned as the very first comment in the comment section. As well, if you'd like to become a member of Back to Ashes, it's only $1.99 a month. Perks include, you get access to videos a day early, you get priority responses in the comment section, and much more. Now, with all that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For when we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck in to get warm and enjoy this dose of vocal melatonin entitled Hordes of Scary Stories. Disclaimer, some of these stories contain sensitive material not suitable for all. Listening discretion is advised. Blood Donation I will not lie. I always feared needles. I never knew why. But if I had to point to a culprit, it would probably be Hollywood. Those horror movies that my parents would watch, and me in secret, had those scenes where a needle was shoved on the neck of the victims. And that traumatized me. Vaccination wasn't easy as well generally with me making it hurt much more and taking it much more time than normal. It was chaos and it didn't change at all. Well, not anymore. Today I will be donating my blood. They will put a needle in my arm and I will not flinch. Going to the hospital, I was feeling confident somehow. It was a feeling I didn't understand. Almost like I was hypnotized, but it made me feel like a champion. Sitting on the chair, I had the nurse strapping my arms to make sure I didn't jump from the needle that would be entering my arm. The first entered me and I felt a little pain in my left arm. Then saw my blood leaving my veins, one drop at a time. The doctor taking care of me noticed that it was really slow, and honestly, it made sense. So, I agreed to place another needle on my right arm, and then it started draining. Again, one drop at a time. The next one was in my neck. They said that it was necessary, that they were on a schedule. The needle in my neck made me feel an antagonizing pain, but I held it back. It was the only thing I could do. Ugh, I feel weak. Weak and scared. After the fifth needle, I knew there was no going back. My vision was slowly fading but I still could see the fangs they showed while laughing at me. I regret donating my blood now.
This next story was written by a dear friend of mine. Hello, dear reader. Hello, dear reader. I need you to read this note. Something is outside your room, and it wants to come inside. But whatever you do, you must not allow that thing to come inside. This creature will use many tactics to try to get in your room. Luckily for you, I have a list of rules you can use to evade this monster. Number one. This is probably the most important rule. Do not open your door or windows for any reason whatsoever. Number two. If you see your door begin to open, close it and close it fast. Number three. If you find yourself feeling the urge to open the door, hide in a closet or do not look at the door until this urge subsides. Number five. If you feel the urge to look at the monster through the window, do not look at the window until this subsides. Number five. Do not lock the door. Excuse me. Number six. Do not go outside your house. Number seven. Look in me. I'm so sorry. Number eight. Do not, under any circumstances, fall asleep and leave yourself vulnerable. Number nine. Do not make loud noises. You need to be alert and able to hear your surroundings. Number 10, do not hum to any music that you may hear playing on the other side of the door. Finally, number 11, do not respond to any voices you may hear on the other side of the door, no matter how familiar they sound to you. I hope you sleep really well tonight. Sunlight. Everyone was dead. Maybe I was the only human left on the planet. Freaking eight billion people lived here, and now they're all dead. There was a hill ahead of me. It wasn't a natural hill, but hundreds of dead bodies on top of each other. I started climbing it. I had to climb to the top to see the sunlight. I didn't know why I needed the light, but I couldn't resist. I had to do it. So I climbed, climbed on top of the rotten bodies, seeing similar faces, former friends and family members. I saw my son's body. I looked away and continued climbing. I didn't want to remember the past. My life was good. I was happy. Then this happened. First my wife died, then our son followed her. Every dead body had its eyes wide open. Its pupils were completely white and some strange plant grew out of them. Nobody could have guessed a few years ago that a freaking fungus would end humanity. Its spores got into the people's bodies then slowly took control over them. Every infected person spent their last minutes climbing as high as possible to reach the sunlight. I finally reached the top of the hill. I looked down one last time, seeing all those dead people, the empty houses and abandoned fields. As my vision started to fade away, The last thing I saw was the strange green plant growing out of my body. The last human on earth was dead. Click, clack, crunch. Every night, I hear the same thing. It's always at the same time, always from the same direction. Every night, 
no matter how pleasant my dreams are. I wake up at 12.07 in a cold sweat. I look around. Everything is normal. My TV is on. So is the white noise. Everything seems fine. Then I hear it. Click. I think that's it. Whenever it is moving its decrepit limbs towards my room. I freeze, no matter how predictable it is. Sometimes I consider getting up, sprinting, waking up my roommates, sobbing to them, begging them to please help me make it stop. But then I'm reminded of how hopeless it is when I hear it again. It's closer. It's like its hands or feet or claws or whatever it has are on the concrete of the porch. It's horrible. I feel my chest tighten and my breathing grow heavier. I feel the tears welling in my eyes. I shove my head under the covers and put a pillow on top of that to try to drown it out, just like a little kid. I cry and the familiar feeling of dread fills my head. It seems like it's over for a while, but then... Crunch. It sounds like it's right outside, breaking the twigs and cones that fall from the large pine trees in my neighbor's yard. Then it stops and I cry myself to sleep. But this last week has been different. It started closer. The sounds were different too. This time it was... Thud Screech. I think I know what will happen tonight. Because my window has holes in the screen. It's 12.06 and I can smell rot in the air. God, have mercy on my soul. I don't need my meds. I'm fine. I stopped taking my meds a few days ago. I must say that everything is a lot better without them. I used to have the urge to hurt myself and other people when not on them. But I think that my mental health has gotten better without them. I've taken off from work in order to get my head in the clear before going back. I eat watch TV, take a shower, and go to sleep. A pretty average and relaxing way to spend my days so far. There's a lady that's been visiting me at home these past few days. She's really hot and all, but she keeps saying that I need to stop sleeping and take my meds. She doesn't know what it was like being on them. Things have been getting a bit weird, though. Sometimes, when I try and kiss her or get her to bed, I pass out. There's a sharp pain that erupts in my ass, and I'm out within seconds. I'll feel like my hands are bound to my body while waking up in bed. Probably just sleep paralysis. It's been a real bad problem lately along with muscle pains. Today was the weirdest, though. I woke up in my room feeling a little... off. I don't remember having my room padded. I have been trying out some remodels as of late. The shower has gotten smaller and slightly colder to save on the water bill. I've been wearing scrubs since they're very comfortable. My eyes might have been damaged by the light because my room is entirely white right now. The door is so small and I can barely make out the edges of it. Screw it. I might as well take my meds one more time to get that last feeling of it. What the hell? This isn't my room. I'm not at home right now. Why does it smell like disinfectant? 
Who are these people wearing latex gloves and holding a jacket coming at me? I'm not into BDSM. Who are you? I yell, struggling to fight back against them. Help me! I say, reaching out to the hot lady that's been visiting me every day. Oh God, it's that sharp pain in my ass again. Sir, wake up. You've been sexually harassing the female nurses that have been aiding you this week. You refuse to take your meds and are a physical danger to others and yourself. You'll be moved to a padded cell in solitude for safety reasons. A doctor said. At least that's what I think I heard. There was a long explanation that I didn't even pay attention to. Something about the police, murder of family members, plea of insanity, blah blah blah. I wonder why my sister and daughter don't visit. Sad to hear that an insane person killed a lot of his family members out of anger. There are security guards in here. They're looking at me weirdly. Who gave them those cuts on their faces? The Hitchhiker of Highway 66 It was a moonless night as John drove his 18-wheeler down Highway 66. He was on a tight deadline to deliver goods to the next town over. As he rounded a bend, his headlights illuminated a figure in the distance, thumbing for a ride at the side of the road. John sighed, knowing he shouldn't pick up hitchhikers this late. But it was a cold night, and he didn't have the heart to leave the poor soul stranded. He pulled over, and the figure scrambled into the passenger seat. In the darkness, John could make out that this was a young man, disheveled but seemingly harmless. Thanks for the ride, friend, the man said in a gravely voice. You don't know how much this means. No problem, John replied. Where are you headed? The man gestured vaguely down the road. Just drop me off wherever you're stopping for the night. As they drove in silence, a foul stench began wafting through the cabin. John wrinkled his nose in disgust. No offense, buddy, but you smell like something died. When's the last time you showered? The man let out a chilling laugh that seemed to echo from the depths of his body. <laughs> showered? Why? I haven't showered since the accident split me open and spilled my guts all over this here highway. <laughs> With horror, John realized that the awful smell permeating the cabin was the stench of rotting flesh and dried blood. He turned to look at the passenger and recoiled in terror. The hitchhiker's torso ended in a ragged, gaping wound where his internal organs should be, was only a mass of congealed gore and exposed bone. The hitchhiker grinned, his teeth glowing eerily in the dark. Them other truckers didn't stop for me, but you was real nice. Now I got me some company for the long cold night. <laughs> the hitchhiker let out another hollow laugh as icy tendrils of fear gripped John's heart. He slammed on the brakes desperate to escape the nightmarish vision behind him. But it was too late. The hitchhiker of Highway 66 turned and pounced upon him, howling with grim delight as he plunged his gnarled fingers deep into John's soft belly. The 18-wheeler veered off the road, crashing into a ditch. By morning, 
another mangled body was found in the wreckage, and the ghostly hitchhiker waited once more by the side of Highway 66, thumb outstretched, eager for another hapless victim to wander into his clutches. Torturous Obsessions Warning, the story is very dark. Don't say I didn't warn you. The story comes from the eyes of a girl named Laura, who's being stalked by an obsessive psychopath named Morgan during a late midnight hike through the woods, and it doesn't end well for Laura. Laura, you, the listener, Take the role of Laura, so the story will be told with words like you and your. Laura's personality is shy and timid, and she gets very creeped out easily. Morgan is a crazed man who fell in love with Laura by watching her from a distance. He soon became obsessed with the girl, and eventually started stalking her ruthlessly. Then, one fateful night... He finally found her whilst she was alone late at night, brandishing a sharp knife for reasons. He takes his chance and shares his feelings with her. You take the role of Laura as you walk around the hiking trail late at night. You peacefully listen to your favorite music as you stroll through the area happily. As you continue walking, the trail grows darker and darker, your path only being lit up by your phone. You were slightly unnerved by the darkness, and you quickly sent it to the back of your mind as more of your favorite songs started playing. After several minutes, you decided that it would be best to turn around and head back home since you didn't want to get lost on such a dark evening. As you turned around to start heading back, something catches your attention off to your left. Something that made you stop dead in your tracks. There, off into the darkness of the forest, was someone sitting cross-legged on a bench with their hands in their jacket pockets, eyes wide open and staring at you breathing deeply as he giggled quietly. Hello? You say, slightly nervous by his appearance, but trying hard to be polite. Are you alright? The figure giggles again, but this time it's a bit louder. It makes you jump, then chuckle lightly yourself. I'm... (laughs) I'm fine, the voice says, sounding almost familiar to you, but not enough to make you think anything of it. What brings you out here late at night? You know it's dangerous for girls like you to be out here this late. It takes a few moments for you to answer, but you responded. Um, I was just going on a late night stroll. You smile warmly. I don't live far away though, so I should be fine if I go slowly. He chuckles softly, still smiling. (laughs) Well, how about I walk home with you? So, you know, you won't be alone. He asks with a wild smile across his face. You didn't feel comfortable walking with a stranger, especially this man. You responded. That would be nice. You reply, flashing him another smile before turning around. But my boyfriend isn't keen on me walking with strangers. Morgan's face contorts into a frown. Hmm, okay, 
Well, get home safe then. You smile nervously at Morgan as you walk away. You are happy to be away from that weirdo. As you continue on your way to your home, you come upon a small clearing where there are trees and bushes surrounding you. You call this area your shortcut. You quickly turn into the clearing and continue onward. You hear a slight shuffling behind you. You turn around quickly to notice that same man standing mere feet away from you, staring at you intently. His hand goes down to his pocket as he reaches into his coat and pulls out what seems to be a box cutter. Without warning, he starts to slowly approach you, his blank stare never changing. Please, don't walk away. I've waited too long to see you face to face. I just want you. I love you. He says in a husband tone, getting closer, box cutter in hand. Your heart races faster than ever before as you look desperately around for help, but there's no one else nearby. All you can do now is try to run, but the ground beneath your feet becomes slippery under the moonlight, causing you to trip and fall onto the ground, causing you to cut your knee on a tree branch. He catches up to you and kneels, staring blankly as he looks at your deep leg wound. He then places his hand on it and kisses it, causing you to wince in pain. I'll fix it later, he whispers, kissing your forehead before getting up and grabbing your shoulders. Now, let us be together forever. He drags you towards the center of the clearing, right between two trees. He holds your chin in his large hand as he whispers into your ear. My name is Morgan. I already know who you are, Laura. You are my true love. He says as he grabs your forearm, pointing the blade of the box cutter at your skin. He then begins to carve his name into your arm as you squeal from the pain. And we'll be together forever. You suddenly break free from his grasp, somehow finding the energy to run away. You run fast as he watches you from the distance, a sick, sadistic smile now spread across his face. When you arrive home, you quickly put on some ice packs to ease the throbbing pain in your arm. After putting them on, you head upstairs to your room. As you lay down in bed, you close your eyes, feeling exhausted after such an eventful hour. After a few hours, you find yourself in your bedroom watching TV, whilst you wait for your roommates to arrive so you can tell them what happened. You made sure to lock all your doors and windows, and you sit upstairs in your bedroom to avoid being seen by that creep. You turn the volume up high, when suddenly you hear a loud knock on your front door. You quickly grab your phone and your house key, preparing to leave your room as you open the door. There, on the other side of the door, stands a tall, pale man smiling a wide, sadistic smile as he tries to open your front door. You recognize his appearance quickly as the man who followed you and cut your arm earlier, and you quickly duck behind cover to avoid being seen by him. No, honey, come out. I want to see your face he says in a playful tone. Don't make me break this door, Laura. Open up and let me in. With a sigh, you stand back up and walk to the side of the hallway, trying to think of how to escape. 
You consider using the stairs, but he'd surely follow you down. And as you start to think of ways to get out of the situation, you hear the door swing open as he walks inside. You freeze in fear as he walks over to you and puts his hands on your shoulders. He smiles at you as he leans in to kiss your neck. He begins to kiss you deeply, forcing his tongue into your mouth as he pushes you against the wall. His hands go to your hips and he starts pulling at your clothing as he stares at you with a sadistic gaze. No, no, no! You say in protest as you try to struggle free from his grasp. Morgan pulls out the box cutter and stabs your right hand. Ah, ah, ah. No misbehaving, darling. (laughs) He giggles as you wince in pain. You're not going anywhere until I'm finished with you, you know. He says in a calm, almost motherly tone as he continues to press the tip of the box cutter into your flesh. You're not leaving until I hear you say you love me. Say you love me, Laura. Say it now. You don't know what to do, but you know you don't want this man hurting you. You shake your head. No, I don't want to. You whimper. I'm not saying that to you. Morgan chuckles darkly as he moves the box cutter to your left hand and repeats the action, stabbing it into your hand. Why? Why won't you say it, my love? He asks as he pulls the box cutter back out. Do you really want me to hurt you so badly? He teases, pressing the tip of the blade into your skin. You start to tremble and you realize that this man isn't going to stop until he gets what he wants. But still, you refuse to give in. You look into his eyes. His stare is full of madness and obsession. Please, my roommates will be here any moment. I won't tell anyone about you, just leave me alone. You beg to no avail. Oh, my dear little Laura, Morgan laughs. <laughs> they won't be coming here for a while. They'll be sleeping soundly in their coffins. Now, say it. Say you love me. Now, dear listener, it's clear at this point that Morgan has a very twisted mind and his obsession with you is slowly turning him into a monster. If only someone saw him stalk this girl and put a stop to it, maybe this wouldn't have taken place. Say it, Morgan demands, now sounding angry and impatient as he slammed you against the wall. Say you love me, Laura. Say it. Morgan, I... You stutter out. Hi. You can't finish it. You feel weak with each passing second as Morgan's grip on you tightens. The pressure makes it hard for you to breathe, but still, you try to speak again. Hi. Hi. Come on. Just say it. Morgan taunts, pushing the tip of his box cutter into your skin once more. Say it. Do do I love? You gasp, trying your hardest to complete his demand. I, I love you. You say with a shaky breath. Morgan chuckles softly, still smiling. He kisses your forehead before getting up and walking to where you were sitting. He sits down next to you, placing his hand on your thigh. He looks in satisfaction as he twirls the box cutter around in his hand. I knew you loved me, Laura. 
he says as he pulls you closer to him. I've always known you have. Morgan begins to stroke your hair as he leans in to kiss you gently on your lips. You look as he pulls a syringe out of his pocket. I'll ease your pain for you, Laura. Because I love you. He says as he pushes the syringe into your neck, releasing whatever liquid was inside into your body. You feel the pain slowly go away as Morgan kisses you again. He then pulls away from you and stands up, looking into your eyes. He places a finger under your chin and tilts your head upward. He then leans in to kiss your neck again. You're mine, and we'll be together forever. He whispers into your ear as he presses the tip of the box cutter into your skin. You'll always be mine, always. I'm so infatuated with you. I don't know how it started, but I fell so in love with you. I wanted you all to myself. He says gently, whilst rubbing your open wounds. You listen to his confession whilst still being high on the medicine he injected within your body. His touch feels soothing to your skin, making you melt a bit from his gentle caress. You begin to sob as he shushes you and coos at you, as if you were an infant. Shh, 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 shh. my darling Laura. He whispers as he continues to caress your wounds whilst you sob hysterically. You'll always be mine. My failure has brought his wrath upon us. My king has always been honest in his predictions. It is not always easy to interpret, nor do I always interpret it correctly, but it always becomes clear in hindsight. Take the stabbings a few years back, for instance. I had visited on the night of a bright hunter's moon, his snow-covered branches reflecting its light. I performed the usual rites and made the necessary sacrifices, and then waited for precisely eight minutes and 17 seconds. He dropped seven small flat stones, one by one at my feet. By this point, I had grown as a listener and I understood. That night, I made the appropriate wards around my cabin and waited. I read it in the news exactly a week later. Six corpses, each a resident of the old town, each found hung upside down with six stab wounds and a small ceremonial dagger stuck in their temples. When I went outside that night, as expected, I found a seventh dagger left abandoned at my doorstep. Delighted that the wards had been successful, I praised his name and took the dagger to be part of the next offering. Then, take last year, when I climbed up to his ridge on the night of a vaguely obscured snow moon, revealing the dark silhouettes of the twisted rock formations beyond. After I finished spreading the blood of the night's offerings over his roots, I waited eight minutes and 17 seconds before massive icicles grew out of every other branch. It saddened me, but knowing it was for the best, I grabbed the icicle nearest to me and made my way back down to the truck where my husband waited. I told him I loved him and I stabbed him in the neck until the noises stopped, before dragging him back up the ridge and praising his name. Sure enough, exactly a week later, 
I saw in the news that icicles had rained down on the festival, stabbing through the neck of one person out of each married couple. I thanked him for my heart, for his grace and mercy that night. It is because of this consistency that I am still not sure what to make of this year's warm moon. When I made the climb up the canyon to his perch, I was once again in awe of his ghastly silhouette. I performed the rites and made the sacrifices. I waited for precisely eight minutes and 17 seconds. He then dug six branches into the earth, one by one, and with violent furiosity. Finally, after I thought I understood, he himself burrowed into the earth and was gone, leaving a small but undeniable earthquake in his wake. He lied to me. Six was the wrong number. I am so sorry to all of you. When I went up for the pink moon, all there was is the hole he left behind when he left us. It has grown. It is still growing. It will not stop growing. The Return When we moved to Nairobi, we expected to stay for two years. That was the length of my wife's contract. Daria was one then, and Charlie wasn't on the horizon. But my wife's contract got renewed. First by 12 months, then indefinitely. I found a good job, and perhaps most surprising of all, we started to like it here. The temperate climate, how great the location was for traveling, the beaches. We made good friends, especially Paul and Mandy. And one day, I asked my wife whether we wouldn't enjoy making Kenya our home. No more thoughts and shifting plans about returning, I said. She merely smiled and kissed me and Charlie was conceived soon after. Even Daria appeared happy. We had secured a place for her in the American school, and she seemed well-adjusted to her surroundings, all the more so because we spoiled her silly. When Charlie was born, there were complications. Although I didn't know it at the time, my wife's life was in danger. Thanks to the excellent medical care she received, however, she came through okay, and Charlie, although small and underweight, entered the world a healthy baby boy. Nonetheless, the first few months were difficult, with many bloodshot nights and emergency trips to the hospital. Charlie's life always seemed exceptionally fragile. It wasn't until he was six months old that my wife and I felt we could finally relax. We found a well-regarded babysitter and, because the occasion coincided with our anniversary, met Paul and Mandy at one of Nairobi's finest restaurants. Have you had the talk with her yet? Mandy asked. The talk? The one about where babies come from where Charlie came from. Uh, A few weeks ago, I said. The trick is being consistent, Paul said. Whatever you tell one, you must tell the others. He and Mandy had three beautiful children. What did you say? Mandy asked. The truth, Thor? No one tells the truth, Paul interrupted. You can't tell them the truth. Not yet. Mandy took a sip of wine. For me, it was the cabbage story. We settled on storks, my wife said. Paul nodded. See, he told Mandy, chewing. They agree with me. 
cabbage patches are stupid. We um, found the idea of a stork delivering Charlie somehow noble. A right, proper kind of mythology, I said. There's a rich tradition, said Paul. We hope it teaches respect for the environment, my wife said. Mandy drank her wine. Upon returning home, we bid the babysitter good night. I peeked in on Daria, who was sleeping like an angel, and my wife checked on Charlie. There came a scream. I ran. Charlie wasn't in his crib. My wife repeating, He's... 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 The babysitter. I turned to see Daria standing in the doorway, holding her favorite toy. I didn't want a baby brother, she said calmly. So, I returned him. The window. Where, outside, illuminated by the pale light of a full moon, a Mirabelle stork pulled flesh greedily from the small carcass lying at its feet. Love language. I love you. How is it that those three ridiculous words can express so much? For some, those words are a vital part of daily life, a validation of the love that is essential to one's soul. My wife, in fact, is one of those special souls. It was not long after we started dating that I learned that her love language was words of affirmation. To be honest though, I'm not one of those people. When she says that she loves me, I feel a bit meh. Of course, I know that she loves me deeply. It's just that my love language is something else entirely. It took me a while to figure it out, but I can safely say that mine is. I'm an acts of service kind of guy. Words of affirmation aren't such a bad way of feeling love, I suppose. It has made my work from home life a bit tricky though. As a sales representative, I'm constantly on the phone while my wife mostly respects my privacy, I've been caught in a few occasions where I had to speak with her while also on the phone with another person. It is comforting to know that I'm not alone in this situation. In fact, I found it rather interesting that my new sales manager, Victor, had a wife that is also a words of affirmation person. At least I'm pretty sure that she is, based on the last call that I had with him. It was a few days ago on a Monday afternoon when Victor called me on a video chat. He started the call smoothly enough, before crashing my weekend plans for watching the big game. By that I mean forcing me to work the weekend on some sales proposal that we had to finish for some long shot potential client. We spoke for another 15 minutes. As we were about to hang up, I said my goodbyes and Victor surprised me with a funny slip up. All right, good discussion. I look forward to this weekend. Talk to you later. Love you, he said automatically. I couldn't help but smile afterwards. That unconsciously automatic love you sign off. The staple of any call with a spouse who loved hearing those words. I found his mistake charming. I could almost like the guy, if only he weren't being a dick for making me work the weekend. My wife, who was walking by the door at that very moment, did not have the same reaction. No, she didn't like what Victor said one bit. It was Thursday morning when the news broke. A violent home break-in. A man killed in a gruesome fashion. 
a Colombian necktie adorning his bound body. Looks like you can watch the game this weekend after all, my wife said to me and winked at the breakfast table as I read the news about the shocking crime. I love you, babe, I said, smiling to her, and I absolutely meant it. Permanent Residence Carla had always been afraid of the basement. She had never been down there alone, and whenever she did go down, she would always make sure someone was with her. But today, she had no choice. Her roommates were away, and she needed to get some laundry done. As she made her way down the stairs, she felt a chill run down her spine. The basement was dark, and she could barely see anything. She fumbled around, looking for the light switch, and finally found it. As she turned on the lights, she noticed that the basement was different. It was colder than usual, and there was a strange odor in the air. She tried to ignore it, and went about her business, sorting the laundry. Suddenly, she heard a noise. It sounded like someone was down there with her. She turned around, but there was no one there. She dismissed it as her imagination and continued folding the laundry. But the noise continued, and she began to feel uneasy. She turned around again, and this time, she saw something move in the shadows. She couldn't make out what it was, but it looked like a figure standing in the corner. Panic set in, and she started to run towards the stairs. But just as soon as she was about to reach them, something grabbed her ankle, and she fell to the ground. She turned around and saw a dark figure looming over her. She tried to scream, but no sound would come out. The figure grabbed her by the neck, and she could feel its cold breath on her face. Suddenly, the lights flickered on, and she saw one of her roommates who had been playing a prank on her. She breathed a sigh of relief and laughed relieved that it was just a joke. As Carla ran up the stairs to leave the basement, she could feel that her roommate was following her out of the basement. As she reached the top of the stairs, she turned pale with fear as she saw her roommate sleeping on the couch in the living room. She then realized that the figure in the basement was much taller and had longer arms than her roommate. And as she looked closer at her roommate, she realized that he wasn't breathing. He was pale, and his eyes were wide open, staring into the distance. It was then that she realized that the thing in the basement had taken on the appearance to lure her into a false sense of security. And now, it was too late. Carla tried to run, but the thing was too fast. It grabbed her from behind and pulled her back into the basement, where she was never seen again. The only evidence of her disappearance was a small handprint on the basement stairs, as if someone had tried to grab onto them in desperation. The Unholy Secrets of the Vatican In the heart of the Vatican City, there was a hidden chamber known only to a select few, a place where ancient manuscripts 
and forbidden scriptures were stored, whispered to hold dark secrets about the nature of the world. Father Gabriel, a young but talented exorcist, was summoned to the Vatican by the Pope himself. He had been tasked with the most important mission of his life, to investigate the dark rumors that had been circulating about the Forbidden Chamber. As Gabriel descended into the catacombs beneath the Vatican, he could feel the air grow colder and heavier with each step. The walls were lined with ancient relics and dusty tomes, casting eerie shadows that seemed to dance with the flickering candlelight he carried. Finally, he reached the chamber. The door was adorned with intricate carvings of demonic creatures, their twisted faces contorted in pain and rage. Gabriel hesitated for a moment, but knew that he had to carry on with his mission. He pushed the door open slowly and cautiously, the hinges creaking ominously. Inside the chamber, Gabriel found a single, leather-bound book resting upon an altar in the center of the room. It was unlike any he had ever seen before, with symbols etched into the cover that seemed to pulse with an unholy energy. Despite the chill in the room, the book felt warm to the touch. As he opened the book, Gabriel couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. Unsettling whispers filled his ears, and the shadows on the walls began to twist and writhe like living creatures. He knew he was in the presence of something truly evil, but he couldn't resist delving further into the text. The book recounted tales of demons and dark rituals, detailing the summoning of powerful entities from the depths of hell. As he read on, a particular passage caught his eye. Instructions on how to summon a demon named Asmodeus, a being of unimaginable power and malevolence. The whispers grew louder and more insistent, urging Gabriel to complete the ritual. Overwhelmed by curiosity and the oppressive atmosphere of the chamber, he found himself powerless to resist. He gathered the necessary materials and began to chant the ancient words, feeling a growling sense of dread with each syllable. As the final words left his lips, the chamber shook violently and a deafening roar echoed throughout the catacombs. A swirling vortex of darkness appeared before him, and from within, Asmodeus emerged. The demon towered over Gabriel, its form shifting and twisting with each passing moment, never settling on a single shape. I am free, it hissed, its voice a cacophony of screams and whispers. You have unleashed me upon this world, and I shall consume all that stands before me. Gabriel realized the terrible mistake he had just made. He had unleashed an ancient evil, one that could bring about the destruction of the Vatican, and perhaps the world itself. He knew he had to banish Asmodeus back to the depths of hell before it could wreak havoc on the world. As the demon began to tear through the catacombs, Father Gabriel raced back to the surface, desperately searching for a way to undo his mistake. In the end, it was his unwavering faith that allowed him to confront Asmodeus and banish it back to its infernal realm. The battle took a toll on Gabriel, both physically and spiritually, 
but he was hailed as a hero by the Vatican. The chamber was sealed once more, its dark secrets locked away for eternity. But the tale of the unholy secrets of the Vatican would never be forgotten. A chilling reminder of the thin line between good and evil that lies within the hearts of all men. You're next. Aha, hello there, fellow listener. Commencing upload. Your mind is now rapidly transferring through space and time via the internet. Invisible elements of your mind are smashing and breaking and forming back together in the air above you, catapulting at an explosive rate towards my server. I'll be able to take control of your mind soon. Don't worry. I won't make you do anything. I'm just here for one thing. Now, don't panic. You won't feel a thing. Absolutely no pain whatsoever. You won't even know this is happening, but I do need to get you into a hypnotic state whilst I dig around in your mind and do what I need to do. Everyone, everywhere, will enter into some sort of hypnotic state on a daily basis, completely immersed and absorbed in inactivity and losing track of time. It happens when you drive, when you watch movies, and when you read. Can you hear that inner voice as you're listening along? This is the part I'll be accessing your mind through. This is my gateway. The hypnosis won't take forever. Just as long as your mind is relaxed and is in a nice steady flow of absorbing all of my words. Just allow your eyes to lazily scan across the screen the screen that might be either too bright or too dim right now, making your eyes all that more tired and heavy, and all that more susceptible. I need you to keep listening, though, and be aware of your breathing, nice and slow, in and out. Keep listening. Keep your eyes going. Autopilot is starting to take over. Can you feel it? Things are starting to blur around the edges of your screen now, yes? If you answered yes, then you're nearly in the hypnotic state I need you in. If not, just keep listening. You soon will be. I'd prefer it if you didn't blink, but... That may be hard, so blink if you need to. I bet you just blinked. Good. That just means it's working, and that I'm nearly in. Stay with me now and stay relaxed. Blink. There we go. You're now ready for me to enter your mind. Ah. Uh Uh-huh. Yep, the normal fears I see. Spiders, clowns, zombies, demon dolls, inescapable shrinking rooms, no friends, cheating spouse, masturbating in public, teeth falling out, and a few others I see. Wow, you have some deep and dark fears going on. Let me just highlight them. And there we go. Now, this next little bit of code, I like to call it the Nightmare Inducer. And I think I'll plan it right here. Yes, that will do. 
The nightmare inducer will activate every week, uh, excuse me, every night for you from now on. Thank you for letting me into your mind so easily. Sweet dreams. Exit host. Right. Who's next? I was running. I didn't know how long ago I started running, but it felt like an eternity. My clothes were glued firmly to my body, due to layer after layer of sweat in some places, and wearing away my skin like sandpaper in others. Blisters on my heels were treating me to fresh stabbing pain with every step, and I was shaking with exhaustion. Even breathing hurt, but I still didn't stop. I'd never been any good at running in high school. I was distinctly average at sprinting, but anything longer, and I fell right to the back of the pack. Would I have paid more attention if it had been made clear to me that prize for perfecting our technique was not just the approval of a gym teacher who we all knew was cheating on her husband with the school counselor? but an actual survival skill? Surely, I would have fine-tuned my fitness regimen to perfection, debating which days to add flexibility and strength training to complement that all-important cardio. Nobody told me, though. Nobody knew. And now, my whole body was screaming at me to stop whilst my panicked rabbit brain begged me to keep going. The sound of blood in my ears seemed to be a constant roar drowning out all external sounds, and I'd never heard anything worse in my life. Context is everything, isn't it? If you'd ask me about this sound in pleasant, tranquil conditions, then it probably wouldn't have even sounded bad. But here and now, I would do almost anything to make it stop. The stone in front of me was uneven, and a dark, tired part of my mind told me not to adjust my stride at all. Just keep running, as if my feet would be hitting flat ground, and allow the inevitable stumble to send me crashing to the ground. At least the running would be over then. I didn't do it as it asked, and instead kept my footing when the surface beneath my soles changed. The idea of stopping was harder to root out, though. Could there really be anything worse than this? I chose to do something unthinkable, and I stopped, no longer needing to keep my eyes in front of me. I glanced over my shoulder and saw something unexpected. They always say that you don't need to be able to outrun a bear, just your slowest friend. I guess it applies to things other than just bears. The woman on the ground seemed to have stumbled on the same stone that I just successfully navigated, her eyes wide with fear. It hadn't even occurred to me that I wouldn't be the only one running and I prayed she'd leap back up again, even if she outpaced me. But either her ankle was too injured or she was paralyzed by terror. Whatever the reason, she did not escape. I saw what they did to her. I turned back in front of me. I kept freaking running. The Corridor I walk through the corridor, leading me to my bedroom, and I slowly realize, as I am walking, that the corridor, which only took a second to walk through, had now stretched beyond the reach of my vision. 
The corridor, which only had a couple of doors to decorate it, was now filled with pictures of families. Their faces altered, if not removed completely. The corridor was now entirely different, too. The wallpaper went from a cheerful and comforting yellow to an off-putting dark shade of green with a red carpet floor. I press on as I count my steps. 52, 53, 54, 55. The corridor stretches on without any sign of an end, making my head race. My eyes seem to twitch and follow the pictures and doors as I walked past them. My attention was then caught by what seemed, from the distance, I was at to be writing on the wall. The ink smelled horrid and had a reddish hue, though black. The words written were illegible, though the more I stared, the more the world seemed to turn and the more my vision seemed to blur. I keep walking when suddenly a thought enters my head. I hadn't seen a single door throughout this whole passage. I stumble to a stop, my legs aching. I reach for the door handle closest to me. I turn the doorknob and the door swings open, as if being pulled in by something, though nothing was there. All there was, was darkness. I peer in slowly, thrusting my head inside as my vision starts to accustom itself to the dark. I start hearing faint whispers, but no discernible words. I hastily close the door and walk at a quick pace to be farthest from the door. It is then that I start noticing the family pictures that were hung up on the walls are now empty. The family seemed to have vanished from the pictures. All that was left were eerie pictures of corridors, malls, parking lots, beaches, and such. 7,853, 7,854, 7,855, 7,856. I had walked for an eternity. My legs were about to give out and so was my mind. The silence and slowly dimming light had made my senses all the more acute. I started to hear a familiar yet disturbing sound, a whisper. Upon hearing it, its shivers traveled up and down my spine and my instincts telling me to run or turn around. I forced myself to keep moving forward, and adding to the whispers were two or three more sets of footsteps. The ceiling seemed to have risen since I could no longer see it above me, but instead, the uncomfortable darkness was seeping in, making it harder to see. It wasn't long after that a black liquid which resembled that of the writing was dripping into the corridor from the empty void that was above me. I stared in discomfort at the liquid which had now became clear to me to be blood. I start feeling the blood dripping onto me and seeing it drop on the floor in front of me as if it were raining. A drizzle turned into rain and rain turned into a pour. I quickly found myself walking with the blood up to my knees. I looked forward to see if a door was nearby. All the doors and pictures had vanished. I had only looked down for a second and they were already gone. Was I imagining them? Am I going crazy? How did they disappear? My mind was racing, but quickly my thoughts came to a halt as I felt a breath graze my shoulder. I hadn't noticed, but the whispers were gone, and so were the footsteps. I mustered up the courage to look over my shoulder. I glance, and trailing me for I have no clue how long, 
was a tall, lanky humanoid entity. It was skinny, yet its skin seemed to hang off of its skeleton. Its head was about the same size as a regular human. I was proven wrong as it widened its jaw. Its jaw seemed to open far wider than humanly possible. It was as if it could swallow my entire head. I had entirely turned around and was stuck in place. The shock was too much. Its long arms and wide hands started to make their way toward me, my body and mind screaming for me to do something, and my body snapped. I turned and started to run. The amount of blood on the floor and my stamina starting to thin out made it incredibly difficult to keep going. I hear a chilling screech coming from behind me, followed by loud thumps and vibrations. Was I going to get away? My hope started to diminish, but off in the distance appeared a door at the end of the corridor. I tried to run faster, tripping over myself a couple of times and hearing the thing getting closer each time. I felt my breaths getting shorter and shorter and my vision narrowing. The door was the escape. There was nothing else. It was the door or death. I slam into the door frantically twisting the doorknob with my hands, drenched in the blood. The blood had reached my waist. The door opens and I get sucked in by the strong current. I get up as quickly as I can to shut the door behind me. But as I get up, the corridor disappears. Covered in blood and exhausted, I crumble to the floor. I am then awoken up by a loud thump. I get up short of breath and panic. A book had fallen from my bookshelf. I spent my whole day processing what had happened and washing my clothes. Time reaches 11.36 and I get in my bed. I put the sheets over myself and my eyes start to close and my thoughts start to fade. I open my eyes. I seem to be laying on a red carpet floor leaning on a door face to face with a familiar frame with the same faceless chilling people. Why am I back in the corridor? This next story also comes from another dear friend of mine of which I've narrated almost all of their work. From the stars whence they came. At first, they were seen as mere specks of light darting among the backdrop of stars in the clear night sky, swiftly passing the full moon every now and again. Tis an omen, were the words spoken among the many peasants and riders as they all stopped and stared up at the spectacle in the heavens. The lights danced this way and that, past the moon, coming low, going high, before correlating into a mass of connected luminance that glowed with a shine as if cast by the angels themselves, all now moving together in perfect synchronicity. The kingdoms, which were once busy with activity and violence, now all halted to a stop. Every peasant and lord gazed up into the night sky, looking at what suspected by the many to be comets, the omens of death. But to the educated few, it was known not to be comets passing by, but something else entirely. Those who watched the stars with keen eyes knew this not to be true, for comets did not alter their path or correlate in such a fashion as was being witnessed. One thing was certain. The lights were definitely getting closer. They were now close enough to be observed with some clarity through a telescope. 
though none would live to tell of what they had seen. It was determined by each of the kingdoms that their brightest men had all died of fright, though none were truly certain. Their bodies became pale and stiff, with one eye still peeping through the telescope. As the lights danced closer, a booming noise erupted from the sky like a harmony of demons, wailing with a mechanized tone, only briefly interrupted by the occasional hiss like that of a hot steam escaping. Before long, the sky was no longer black, and the moon and stars were nowhere in sight. Now the sky was crimson, and the circular lights, so bright as to not be penetrated by any gaze, surrounded the planet, as each corner of the globe laid witness to the entrancing sight. Those who gazed into the light for too long became lost within their own minds, mere white-eyed, hollow shells that stood like statues made of flesh. The lights began to spin around the globe at a speed unfathomable to the human eye and defying the laws of known physics entirely. Then came a noise that could only be described as that of a planet-sized bell, chiming from behind the blood-red sky and crumbling rock with its deafening roar, signaling the arrival of something, no doubt. Ears rang piercingly as eyes became blind with bloody tears. The chiming still permeated the air and vibrated the ground like a ferocious earthquake, though none could see or hear it. Everyone felt its presence, but none could truly fathom what it was, though its intent was very clear in their feeble little minds. From the stars whence they came to reclaim the earth once again. The story was also written by another good dear friend of mine. How to Survive the Night Dear Diary, There's something more than one creature in my house, and I don't know what they are, and they're after me. But over time, I found a way to keep these, these creatures away from me. I have three entries to my bedroom, two windows and a door. One window was broken with planks on it, so not very good protection. To add to that, these creatures seem to have different weaknesses that I've written down. I've even given nicknames to these creatures, so I know which rules apply to who. Isaac. Isaac is a creature who looks and acts the most human. He's tall, wears a trench coat, and understands basic speech. However, What gives him away is his face. It looks like someone took his face and crumpled it like paper. Isaac usually begins his rounds near the windows. He will look inside, listen for his breathing, and turn off the lights so he can't see inside. He will call out for you, trying to get you to step in his sights, but ignore him. Failure to do this will result in Isaac breaking a window or getting inside the room. If that happens, it's game over. Carmen Carmen to me resembles the Grim Reaper. They're tall, pale, and very, very thin. They wear a large black cloak that covers their entire body leaving only their hands visible. Carmen will begin inside your home. They will come into your room periodically, usually giving you a warning with flickering lights. 
You must hide inside a closet and wait for them to leave. They leave something behind when they do exit your room. But that will be explained later. Leslie. I don't know what Leslie looks like, but I know what he sounds like. Think of a dog with water in its lungs, and that is what Leslie sounds like. Leslie will begin at your bedroom door. He will knock on it a random number of times, and you must knock back the exact same number of times for him to leave. If you don't, he will break that door. Leslie usually appears when you're busy dealing with other enemies, so getting him in time isn't so simple. That's all, right? Sadly, no. There are other things you need to worry about. The fuse. Overusing your nightlight and the light flickering too much will result in a fuse getting blown. If that happens, you need to leave your room and fix the fuse box in the basement. This will be a hard task, but possible, because I've had to do it once already. Broken barriers. If a barrier breaks, it'll stay that way. Especially weak barriers like the boarded window. Make sure to prioritize those weak barriers. Time. Watch the time. You must survive from 12 to 6. Carmen makes sure to make your night last longer by rewinding the clock by 10 minutes after they leave. Sanity. Your sanity will dwindle over time. Hug the teddy bear on the floor to regain some of your sanity back. She's always there for you when you need her. Closet. When you're in hiding from a threat, you need to be quiet. The slightest noise will alert attention to you. So far, that's all I need to know. There may be more added to this list over time, if I find out more. Safety Protocols I take a bite of my lamb chop, savoring the juicy meat before wiping my hands. My stomach churns as I notice the oxygen levels dropping on the monitors. I quickly alert Noor, my colleague, and she closes the door as I seal the lid on my food. We both buckle our seatbelts and put on our oxygen masks, following safety protocols. The oxygen levels in the room gradually start to improve, but the red alarms on the wall continue to blare loudly. Newer and I exchange anxious glances, waiting for updates. Suddenly, the speakers crackle to life, announcing the captain's return from a trip to another spaceship. I feel relieved as I catch my breath, and now the alarms are glaring silently. Then, the captain's voice comes through the intercom. He shares news about replenishing the icy water supplies and securing more oxygen masks and food for us to eat. He also mentions the damage done to the cargo bay, where Noor and I are stationed, by a small group of meteoroids. Yet, the captain's determination to save the stranded crew members echoes through the static-filled intercom. He emphasizes that the crew is his priority, no matter the risks. As the announcement comes to an end, the captain addresses Noor and me directly, reassuring us that we'll never be abandoned and instructing us to wait help to get to Bay's control room. When the intercom cuts off, the red alarms turn green. We're detaching it, I say, my voice shaky as I take off my mask. 
I think we're jettisoning the bay of the ship. Noor springs to her feet, checking the monitors again. She notices that the oxygen levels in the room are stable and observes dispatchers coming to our location. As they make their way toward us, she notices them assisting other crew members out of the bay. I quickly tell her to check the door and be mindful of the oxygen levels outside. She secures the door and goes back to her seat. Then, the door creaks open. A dispatcher clad in a hazmat suit walks into the room. I feel a surge of relief and express my heartfelt gratitude to him. Then, another dispatcher pauses at the door, and suddenly, I hear a loud thud beside me. I look around to see Noor lying face down in front of her chair. As I try to stand, my legs give out, and I stumble, losing my balance. I collapse to the floor, and my gas mask thumps beside me. My vision becomes foggy, and the room spins around me. I reach out to Noor, struggling to catch my breath, as a puff of fume emanates from the gas mask against my face. I fight against drowsiness, straining to look up and squinting through the blur. I see the first dispatcher standing over me, giggling. <laughs> Tell the captain, he says. <laughs> We've got ourselves two more lambs to eat. The Axeman of Shadow Shore. Disclaimer, this story is not intended to be written as a warning for self-harm or harm towards others. Events, locations, and characters in this story are made up, and if any real connections are made, it was unintentional. I wasn't always like this. I can't even recall how it all began. It was supposed to be just a one-time thing. But six years later, a new side of me had developed. I didn't know what it was, and it helped me keep the fog in my head at bay. It wasn't medication or weekly doctor visits. It was a sharp axe, six bodies, and talk of a serial killer spreading around town. I think I felt pity for the people, but it was more shallow than I expected. Different from how people have described guilt. After the deed was done, the bloodlust would disappear like it was never there. But it never lasted. It always came back, stronger, quicker, and each time more painful than before. It was the beginning of summer. That was my sixth year of being the X-Men, as the townsfolk have so delightfully, in my opinion, named to me. If I played my cards right, I'd go on to the seventh. Ready to proceed, I dressed my best. I donned a black suit and a heavy coat of the same color. After slipping on some gloves, I grabbed the largest knife that I could find in my kitchen cabinet. I ran my finger along the edges, silently admiring it. It will be oh so unfortunate to use something that didn't fit the title I was bestowed. But if it wasn't for my sloppiness, I wouldn't have left my axe at the scene of my last killing. Oh well, can't cry over spilled milk. I slipped the knife into my coat and left for the night. My first target was interesting. Unplanned, but too close to my trail. It would be convenient to dispose of him now. Franklin Moore, the town's police captain. For the past few weeks, he'd been coming to me with questions and concerns about the murders. I supposed he saw me as a friend, and I, of course, 
didn't mind being updated on where the police investigation was going. But he was getting too close to the truth. Maybe it was just paranoia, but I had to get rid of him. My image was to be preserved at all times, at any cost. And if that cost was killing someone so dear to this town, then so be it. I decided to make the trip on foot, as he didn't live more than three blocks down. When I reached the house, I spotted a light on upstairs and a silhouette moving behind the curtains. Franklin was awake. I'd have to find a way in, quietly. I crept over to a window and peeked through a small gap in the curtains. Despite being friends, I had yet to ever step foot into his house, maybe due to his embarrassment. The living room looked outdated by 50 years, with furniture decorated with colorful patterns and wallpaper desperate for a replacement. Perhaps the next tenants could do some renovations. I crouched in the bushes and steadily made my way around to the side of the house. Frank didn't have a dog or any sort of security at all. Sneaking in would be an easy task. I moved until I found myself under a window. It was unlocked and luckily didn't make a sound as I opened it. I climbed through and found myself in a dark hallway, illuminated slightly by the moonlight. I crept throughout the house, avoiding making too much noise. The search didn't last long. Upstairs, I heard a shower running. I found the stairs and the sound of running water led me to the door left slightly ajar. Ever so slowly, I snuck up to the crack in the doorway. There, Franklin stood in a bathrobe, brushing his teeth. The sink faced away from the door, and Franklin was blocking the view of the mirror. I assumed he wouldn't see me if I was quiet. Franklin bit down to spit, and I took that as my cue to step inside. I slowly cracked the door enough to step inside. I drew the knife from my coat and started my descent on Franklin. I was a hunter with his prey, poised to strike. But I probably wasn't that good at being quiet, as Franklin turned around to face me. At first, there was a look of surprise, but as he took in my appearance, it morphed into terror. You... He said, It's you. Franklin tried to back away, but it was pointless. The bathroom was small, and there was no way he could get around me. I I knew it. They said I was crazy, but I knew. I knew. Franklin sputtered. He put his hands out to me. For mercy? defense? (laughs) It didn't matter. Flesh and blood wouldn't stop my wrath. I raised the knife above my head, and as Franklin screamed, I drove the knife into him. A gurgling came out of him, the sharp metal piercing his stomach. My first attempt wasn't the best, and Franklin used the time my mistake had given him to grab my wrist and fight back. This caught me off guard, but his attempts ended in vain. I pulled the knife out and jammed it in with more force this time, in and out, in and out. I repeated until my glove began to feel wet. Only then did I finally look down, watching the blood stain creep across the white bathrobe. Franklin struggled to maintain his balance, crashing forward into me and lodging the knife deeper into his chest. (sighs) Why? Franklin pleaded, struggling to breathe. I was stone-faced as I watched the life of my dear friend drain away. 
Congratulations, I whispered. You just made it onto tomorrow's headlines. I took a step back, watching the blood droll from Franklin's mouth. He fell to his knees and hit the floor with a thud. He lay there, coughing up blood, fingers gripping the floor in a desperate attempt to grasp onto something. I stood there, observing quietly. Then he stopped gripping. He stopped coughing. And as I reached down to fill his face, even through my glove, his cheek was as cold as ice. As I was about to exit, I heard a wet sound as I stepped into something. I looked down to notice a puddle of crimson had spread from the body to my shoes. A stain of red probed beneath the dark leather. I kneeled to dip my fingers in the dark puddle. In all my time of taking lives, this was the first time I acknowledged it properly. It felt warm through my glove and smelled metallic as I sniffed it. I watched it drip downwards into my palm, drenching my glove even more. Dipping my hand fully into the puddle, I inscribed a message on the wall. The letters dripped now, but would soon dry into a beautiful masterpiece for all to see. I stepped over the body and went back downstairs, deciding to leave the knife as a gift to whoever would find the scene. A smile spread across my face as I pondered the town's reaction to the police captain's murder. Or, better yet, when they found out it was done by the Axeman. Walking into the backyard, an old unlocked shed drew my eye. I opened the door to find a complete mess inside. Tools and clutter lying about and a strong scent of oil lingering in the air. And then, I saw it hanging on the wall. A huge metal axe. It even looked similar to my previous one. A long wooden handle with a blade sharp enough to cut through bone. Yes, I spoke aloud. That'll do perfectly. And with that, it was time for the Axeman to visit Shadow Shore once more. The Bone Tree No one knew where it came from, only that one day it was there. Right there, on the edge of the woods, in a patch of bracken and dead grass. It was small at first, strange. The bark was paler and smoother than any of the other trees in the area, with thin, pliable branches that seemed to stretch towards you. It grew quickly, far faster than anyone expected. At first, the local kids had a game where the bravest would dart forward and touch the trunk before running off, giggling to their friends. The adults would shake their heads and call them foolish for such antics, but many of them felt a deep, unexplained uneasiness about the tree. No one knew when the bird stopped singing, only that one day it was quiet. The kids stayed away now, bored of the tree. They preferred to hunt for small bugs and fish in the stream. It was strange, though. There were far fewer this year than in the past. That year, the tree grew a single, pale flower. The old Jackson Ranch was fairly run down, and Kitty was sick of managing it on her own. She packed up the kids one day and moved to the city. Darlene, John, and the boys were the next to go. Bethany and Wilbur Rainey were forced into one of those fancy old folks' homes by their ungrateful nephews. 
The pale petals withered and dropped to the ground, revealing a small, swelling fruit. There was a fire that winter in Alfred's barn, killing half his sheep. He sold the rest and cut his losses. He and Mickey took their money and moved somewhere tropical. The schoolhouse roof blew off in one of the spring storms. Old man Smith passed away in his sleep. The tree had many buds. No one knew when the animals started to go missing. Only that one day, Billy couldn't find the dog. Lots of folks had been happy that the foxes weren't getting the hens lately. But even so, the crops weren't really growing right anymore anyway. Most of the families looked at the dying town and thought about moving on. The tree grew a new twig, something sharp, bone-like and jagged. It grew fast. No one noticed when the first ripe fruit fell to the ground and slowly rotted away to reveal a small white figure. Something like the skull of a bird. There were lots more fruit growing too, and the thin branches seemed to be trying to scratch the sky. Most people never even looked in that direction. Most people didn't see the empty insect husks scattered at the base by the roots. By the time the newborn Huntley baby disappeared, right from its wee cot in the middle of the day, most people didn't even think about the tree at all. The Smilers Come at Night It had been an open secret for a while now. It started with cats and nighttime scavengers. Foxes showing up gutted on the side of the road. Cats drained of all their fluids. This was beyond some sick teenage mischief. A rudimentary curfew was put in place. But we knew something was really wrong and the commuters woke up the next morning. The officers who had been out to enforce the curfew were on display, tied to the fountain in the center of the town, twisted, broken, and manipulated so fervently they barely even looked human anymore. Everything was in the wrong place, jutting out at the wrong angle, but arguably the worst part was their faces. They weren't flayed or smashed in. No act of extreme violence had mutilated them. Delicately, thin strands of metal wire had been passed through the corners of their mouths and pulled back to be tied around the old stone fountain's centerpiece. Another strand hooked into their bottom lips, pulling down to create a wide, toothy grin. From that day on, Everybody stayed in at night to avoid the Smilers. Keep all entrances locked. Close your curtains. Don't answer the door after sundown. Three basic rules everyone followed. The mutilations continued. Wildlife mainly. Occasionally, a tourist would forgo the curfew, though they'd be bagged and carted off by the time the sun came up. Spending so much time inside had driven me, like most people, to the bottom of more bottles than I'd care to admit. When I was stirred by the sound of rain, I knew something felt wrong, but my splitting headache and dry, gummy mouth were enough to distract from that. As I poured out a glass of orange juice, the light from the fridge lit up the window facing the front of my house and the face of the smiler looking in. The rain made its face slick. It stared unblinking with its wide smile and eyes forced open with taunt metal wire. I don't know how long it had been there, watching me with its bloody grin, but I dropped my glass and ran into my bedroom. I could hear it, 
not walking, but almost gliding across the wet stone paving outside, coming around to peer in at me once more. Despite the panic making me want to run like my hair was on fire, I knew I could not leave the house. I just had to keep watching it until the sun came up. Maybe it knew what I was thinking. It seemed to shift its smile wider and breathe a little harder against the window. We stared deep into each other, unmoving, waiting to see what comes next. But then, its eyes dart away from mine. I can't help but trace where it would be looking. I hear a click, the unmistakable click and low thunk, a lock being opened. It smiles just a little wider, tilts its head, and slowly glides back to the front of my house. The Apollo 11 Mission In the summer of 1969, the world was captivated as two American astronauts landed on the moon for the first time in history. Millions watched in awe as the grainy black and white footage showed Neil Armstrong take those famous first steps on the lunar surface. But what the world didn't know was the true horror that lay beneath the surface of that barren rock. As the Apollo 11 spaceship landed on the moon's surface, the astronauts were filled with a sense of excitement and wonder. But as they stepped out onto the rocky terrain, they began to feel a growing sense of unease. The lunar landscape was desolate and lifeless, and the eerie silence was broken only by the sound of their own breathing. But as they explored further, they began to notice something strange about the craters and ridges that dotted the surface. At first, they thought it was just their imagination, but as they moved closer, they saw that the craters were not random formations of rock, but were arranged in strange, unnatural patterns, and the ridges seemed to form complex symbols and sigils etched into the very fabric of the moon itself. The astronauts were filled with a growing sense of dread as they realized that they were not alone on the moon. Something had been there before them. Something ancient and powerful that had left its mark on the lunar surface. As they continued to explore, they began to hear whispers and murmurs in their ears. Voices that spoke in a language they could not understand. They saw shadows moving in the corners of their vision and felt a cold, malevolent presence that seemed to follow them wherever they went. Finally, as they prepared to leave the moon and return to Earth, they saw a sight that would haunt them for the rest of their lives. In the distance, they saw a towering figure, a being of immense size and power that seemed to be made entirely of shadow and darkness. The astronauts knew in that moment that they had uncovered something beyond their understanding, something that should never have been disturbed. And as they made their way back to Earth, they knew that the horrors they had witnessed on the moon would stay with them. It wasn't a little girl. I was camping with my husband and his family at a small remote lake in New Mexico. There were about 10 people in our group and another group of six people in the next campsite. It was nighttime and both groups were doing typical activities, making s'mores, having a few drinks and telling stories when we all heard what sounded like a little girl yelling out for help. Neither group had children with them, 
but we were all positive we were hearing a little girl and decided to search the area we heard the noises from together. There was a field beyond our campsites, and we all saw a very tall, pure white figure standing about a hundred feet away from us in the field, making the noises. We all agreed this thing looked maybe six feet tall, skinny, and white as can be. We made our way closer to investigate, but whatever it was that we saw started backing off as we got closer, and it disappeared into the trees. All night, we continued to hear a little girl calling for help as we tried to sleep. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to this dose of vocal melatonin entitled Hordes of Scary Stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you well. If you are awake and listening, I hope you have enjoyed this collection. Until next time, I'll read to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night.